All right. <laughs> so I want to finish the proof of Stokes' theorem. And then I'll make a few more comments, and then we're going to start the discussion of the classical way of doing this stuff. So we, we're trying to prove the integral of d omega over m, I'm leaving out all the hypotheses, of course, the integral of, m, of omega over the boundary. And we, we had reduced to the case by using a partition of unity argument, we had reduced to the case of working in a coordinate chart or in the image of some parameterization. And what I did finish yesterday was the case where the parameterization avoids the boundary. And we saw that in this, in this case, this would be 0. And we showed that this side was 0 by applying Stokes theorem. I mean, by applying from a theorem calculus. And now I want to do the case where you have a parameterization that hits the boundary. And so we, we had G mapping an open subset now of RK plus So that means this is the stuff in RK where the last coordinate is positive <coughs> or zero. And we're mapping that to this piece of M, and what we're considering is this form which I called phi, which was the pullback of omega. And you'll have it in your notes that we wrote that in this form of plus or minuses for strategically chosen reasons, functions times ranges of all but one of the dx's. And we checked the d phi was the sum of the various partials cleverly taking the jth partial of the jth function. We had this yesterday. We'll see that showing up again today, later. And we're trying to integrate over a picture like this. We're trying to integrate d phi over this and see that it's the same as integrating phi over the boundary which in this picture is the part of this in, this in the hyperplane where xk is 0. So as before, remember that this, func this form phi was 0 before you got to the edge of u. So it's actually 0 outside of some compact subset of u. And it, like I did yesterday, I'm going to track this whole thing in a rectangle into the integral. And say, OK, let's think about doing an integral, an integral over a rectangle. But the difference between yesterday and today is that because I'm working in, where, in the half of RK, my rectangle is going to have one of its faces on the xk equal to 0. So my rectangle now my rectangle is going to look like the various coordinates doing whatever they feel like it, whatever they feel like for the first k minus 1, but in the last coordinate I've got to start at 0 and go up to, to say b sub k. Right, because I'm Everything is defined starting at 0 and going up. So in the last coordinate, I'm going to go from 0 to b sub k. That's my rectangle. Okie dokie. So what happens when I integrate d phi over the rectangle? I get a sum of multiple integrals. So I get a sum of integrals of partial of fj with respect to xj dv. Now, using your divine inspiration, 
how do I want to iterate to do this iterated integral? Do dxj first. I would like to do x, dxj on the inside. <coughs> wow, that is what a lot of lunch. So I'm going to have a sum where I'm going to do integrals over all the variables except j, and then do the j integral on the inside. I'm not going to write it all out pedantically. So this is good. But I'm going to specialize. This is good. I'm going to do the case where j is less than k, and then I'm going to write the kth one down separately. For the kth one, what happens on the inside when I integrate dxk? Right, this one goes from 0 to b sub k. So I want to emphasize that 0 here. Whereas all of these are going from a sub j to b sub j. All of those are doing stuff like this, going that way. So what happens when I integrate dxj and go from aj to bj here for any value of the other variables? I'm doing fundamental theorem of calculus like we did yesterday. I'm getting fj here minus fj here. Well, what is that? Zero. Right? The functions are all zero outside of this compact set in here. So fj here minus fj there, those are all zero. So these, these integrals are all zero, no matter what values the other x's have. What happens here, though? I get fk here minus fk here, and all of a sudden one of them makes zero. So what do I get for this whole thing? I get integral over all the other variables. So in this picture, I would be integrating over the projection of this thing into the rk minus 1 down here. So I'd be like integrating over here. The function that does integral minus integral with respect to xk. What do I get? I get fk at x1 to xk minus 1 bk minus fk at x1 to xk minus 1 0. And then I'm integrating that dx1 up to dxk minus 1 over the, over the projected breakdown. So this would be like, well, whatever. So what does this turn into? Ken said it a while ago. You get negative, right? You get negative the function on the plane where k, xk is 0. Now, why in the world is that what I would get when I do the integral of phi on the boundary? <clears throat> so, on the other hand, what is the integral of phi over the boundary? So the boundary again in this picture is this piece here. So of all the terms in phi, what happens when I restrict to the set where xk is 0? So this, remember, means xk is 0 here. What happens to all these dxks? They pull back to 0. So of all these terms, which is the only one that's going to show up? The one in which dxk is missing.
So what is that? Well, it's the integral over the boundary then of minus one to the k minus one f sub k dx one reg dx k minus one. And I'm at points where the last coordinate is zero. So this is x one to x k minus one, zero. That looks a lot like this. Except there's something funny going on. K is somehow even. Hmm? K is somehow even. No, K okay, is not even. Somehow we get that minus one. Are you telling me you don't believe that K minus one is always odd? Well, that's why K was even for Ken. I get it. But it's not, right? Do you remember, once upon a time, we made a big fuss about how we oriented the boundary? And what did we check from that definition about the boundary of RK plus? Was it always the standard orientation on RK minus 1? No. No. What was it? Negative 1 to K times. Aha, uh -huh. Daniel remembers. I wasn't even here. And you weren't even here. <laughs> Are you happy now? Yeah. When you, or, when you integrate over this boundary, this is not the same thing as just integrating over that rectangle in RK minus 1. It's off by that sign. So integrating over the boundary, by definition, means minus 1 to the k integrating over the rectangle in that, I'll call it r prime here, integrating over the projection of this rectangle. Correct. So I told you when we were discussing that arcane definition that the whole point of the boundary orientation was to make Stokes' theorem work, and now you see that. That's exactly the sign that you need to, to get the minus x to work out here. Any proof? QED. QED. So, Not so E, but QD. Is that Hmm? Um, negative 1 to the k times negative 1 to the k minus 1 is just 1 negative 1. 2k minus 1. Yeah, 2k minus 1, which is always 2k minus 1 is always negative. Fine. Okay. So it's just the fundamental theorem of calculus plus a ton of definitions. But it's a very powerful theorem and I hope to convince you over the next week plus of how powerful this stuff is. So that's my goal. Any questions? Yes, sir. Right now, there's enough time passed that we put the E in the QED. <laughs> that's, that's for you to decide. All right. It has been shown. The E is the has been. So a comment. Before I go on, on, the, on number 23. So, uh, the comment I want to make on number 23 is that the hint in the book says use definition one of a manifold to show blah 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 blah. What is the first definition? We had these three alternative definitions. 
It's the explicit, where you think of the thing as a graph. So you can, you can represent M locally as a graph over one of the standard coordinate planes. Right? That was one of our things that we got out of the implicit function theorem. So you can cover M up with open sets. each of which is parameterized specifically by project by xi1 to xik. So now we're doing parametric. No, I'm going to think of it as a graph over that, i.e. each of which is a graph over the x1, xi1 to xik plane. So for example, you could parameterize this thing by a piece of the xy plane if you were in three space. Now, your surface, your manifold, has an orientation on it. So that means that you ought to be able to decide that you should be able to order the variables correctly so that you're getting the same orientation on the manifold given the order that you put these things in. Remember we talked about doing a hemisphere when I first started surfaces? When we did the upper hemisphere, xy was the right order, but when we did the lower hemisphere, xy was the wrong order to get the right orientation on the hemisphere. So I would say reorder to make the orientations compatible. So schematically, in this picture, I would say order the variables this way to give a counterclockwise orientation there. That would be compatible. Compatible with what? You're given an orientation on M. We're trying to construct a K form. So what this is saying then is that if I take dxi in the order that I've reordered them to make things compatible, this is a positive K form on this piece of manifold. So I literally, in this case of the pictures that we were using in, in, for surfaces, I'm saying dx wedge dy here. gives you the right orientation on the surface. So think of that two form on M sitting inside RM. Think of this two form sitting on this surface sitting in R3. And now what I'm just going to tell you to do to finish the problem is putting your partitions of unity functions to bump the things off so that they're so that you're only working with this on this open set that we're talking about, and add up. Check that this works. So you're basically adding up forms that are smooth functions times these on the various pieces. And you want to say that gives you a globally defined number zero k form. So that's the way to proceed. And that was what the hint of the book was telling you to do. But you guys who came and asked me about it didn't tell me that you'd read the book. Right, you have to check. You have to use the part of the definition of these things, and you have to check that you've chosen all of these compatibly. So when you glue them together, you're taking positive combinations of positive things. Okay, so that's what you have to think through. I'm not going to do the problem in its entirety. Okay. Questions on any other homework problems? Stuff from chapter section six, I'm, I'm about to start talking about how to get into the notation for section six.
Any, any other questions? Okay, so what I want to do now is talk specifically about vector calculus in R3 and the standard notations. I've been trying to show you guys standard notation, but I want to be more thorough here. I want to give you a dictionary of standard notation, comparing our stuff with what people learn in the standard calculus course or physics. So if we're in R3, we've got what kinds of k-forms if we're in R3? 1, 2, and maybe 3. And 0. Don't leave out the world. 0. So we've got 0 forms, 1 forms, 2 forms, and 3 forms. Hope I left in All right, what's a zero form? It's a function. What is a function? Classically, it's a function. Okay, that was easy. What's a one form? Well, it's a thingy that has a single dx and a dy and a z. Easy. And what's the meaning of, it, of, it, of integrating such an omega? No. One form on a curve. All right, the classical viewpoint is that the one form corresponds, as we've been doing, to a vector field. components are F1, F2, F3, and the classic notation here becomes that the, the, the work is integrating the tangential component of the force field along the curve. Okay, we've done this. In fact, we've done everything I'm going to do, but I'm going to make more connections today. Now we come to a two-form, which I'm going to call eta, and what's our recipe Again, it corresponds to a vector field, which maybe I'll call G for now to be less confusing. Again, you have G1, G2, G3. And what's the physical interpretation if I have a vector field and a surface? Flux. Now I do flux. <laughs> so I'm doing the integral of G dot the normal vector D surface area. That's flux. And what's the recipe for the two form. The first coordinate goes with uh, dy which dz, and so on. I'm not going to keep writing it all out. And then the integral of eta is the flux of g. <laughs> and the flux is the rate of flow, right? Not the amount of flow. Correct. Well, it depends on the units. Oh, okay. So the example I did, our F was density times velocity for the flow, and so then it was rate. Okay. If you didn't do, if the vector field didn't have per time in it, then the flux would be amount. Third, okay, so there's a lot of connections I'm about to make here, but three form. So three forms look like function times wedge of dx1, dx2, dx3, or dy, dx, dy, dz, right? And classically, you would be back to functions again, but you would be thinking of doing a volume integral. Okay? Now, I want to start embellishing my little dictionary here. First thing you guys have observed, or maybe you haven't, but this was being discussed before, off, before class started. How do you turn a one form that you want to do a work integral for into a two form that you want to do for a flux if you want the same f? Star. That's star. So the star operator is turning f1 dx 
plus F2 dy plus F3 dc into F1 dy wedge dz plus F2 dc wedge dx in that order plus F3 dx wedge dy. You also had a homework problem in section four, section three, where you had star just an R2. Do you remember that? And then it just turned it dx into dy and dy into negative dx. But you had a homework problem where you converted Green's theorem into a flux form as well. So basically star in R2 turns work into flux and star in R3 turns work into flux. All right, so that's a cool way of understanding that if you have a fixed vector field, you can turn it into either a one form or its star, which would then be used as a two form to do flux for that. Now, how do I go from here to here? D. Well, surely there's something that's happening that translates D into the, this side. Alright, slow down. Let's start at the beginning. Okay. So I start with a function. I take D of it and I get a one form. What's the corresponding vector field? If gradient. 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 Right, everybody agree with that? The partial derivatives as the coefficients is exactly the gradient. Now, what we have not yet discussed is what happens here, although you've been doing it in homework now for over a week. If you start with if I start with the one form, and I take D of it, I get a two form. And I've never made you guys, nor myself, write down a formula for this. We've just done it, right? But what is the formula if I take D of this? I'm going to have some stuff that has a dy wedge dz, and I'm going to have some stuff that has a dz wedge dx, and I'm going to have some stuff that has a dx wedge dy. Can you fill in the blanks? That's three minus f2. Yeah. So let's Partial see. Partial of f1 with respect to f. Partial of f1. Now, first of all, there's no dx's, yeah. so it's got to be these guys. Yeah. So it's Partial of f2. Yeah. Over, over um, partial y. No. Wait, partial partial z. z. If you're doing the derivative yeah, yeah, of this, yeah, you need yeah, a z. z. But then you would have a dz dy, and you want dy wedge dz, right. so it gets a minus. And then we have positive. Then I'd have positive partial f3 with respect to y. And similarly, you would have here, notice by the way there's a pattern, right? You have to have the partials going with the two forms that I have, and you have to have corresponding components of F, but switched. So what should I have here? I should have a dz and a dx. Did I do that wrong? No, I did it right. So F1, F3, partial that. And then here I should have a dx and a dy, and obviously df2 and df1. Well, by our dictionary, this corresponds to a vector field. Now, by our dictionary, this started with a vector field as well. This vector field that I get here 
that has these ridiculous collections of partials in them, of course you want to write this down 25 times a day. Oops. Five dollars for me if I can do this without screwing it up. There is some sort of cyclic rotation pattern going on here. All right, what is this ridiculous thing called? Well, this ridiculous thing is called curl of f. You start with a vector field, if you're in Math 2270, and you are taught how to compute the curl with this ridiculous bunch of formulas. Now, you can't help but think about how this reminds you of doing determinants. Doesn't this remind you of doing minors, cofactors of determinants? Like, if I put F1, F2, F3 here, this thing would come from doing a little determinant if I had E1, E2, E3. This thing would be coming from doing a cross product where formally I'm putting as a quote vector in the middle the partial derivative entries. This is like turning D into a vector. If you took partial respect to x dx plus partial respect to y dy plus partial respect to z dz, that would be like making a vector of d dx d dy d dz. That's what we've done here. If you formally interpret this times this to mean take the partial of this with respect to y, and you interpret this times this to mean take the partial of f2 with respect to z, then if you expand this determinant, in cofactors down the middle. Well, no, no, no. Expand the way we've always done cross product. You'll get exactly this vector field. And so physics books and calculus books write curl as take del and cross it with f, where del stands for the vector whose entries are the partial derivative signs. So this is not literally a vector. It is actually something that's called a tensor but we're not going there. But you can think of this as being what you would do if you turned ddx, ddy, ddz times dx, dy, dz into the corresponding side of the dictionary here. So physics books will write this literally, and math books you'll see too, if you look at a standard calculus book, you'll see curl written as del cross f, because this is how people actually compute it. Now you guys are probably faster at this point just taking a one form and taking D of it. You can probably do that faster than you can doing all this. And so I'm not going to force you to use this notation other than to say there will be a web work problem where I ask you to compute a bunch of things using this notation. But you can compute them any way you want. So this is curl. What it means, I'm going to tell you. So if you start with a vector field and you compute its curl, you get another vector field and it has physical meaning. Which we're going to talk about. So I've explained the second arrow. So this arrow is called curl. And this last one, since Reese just gave it away, is called div. Is that gradient cross product? That's what we just did. Oh, no, I'm just, that's what the notation was. Del, do, del cross what f, f, right? Now, what happens when we go two forms to three forms? So I start with a two form. I guess I should have done it up on that board. 
If I start with a two form, again, thinking of it as corresponding to a vector field. Take D. You now get a three form. What do you get? DF1 DX plus DF2 DY plus DF3 D. Aha. Does this remind you of what we were doing left over here when we were doing the Stokes theorem stuff? This is exactly what we ended up with when we wrote summation partial fj with respect to xj. So here you're taking the first component of your vector field and doing its first partial, plus second component, second partial, third component, third partial. This is exactly the formula we had appearing in our steps there. So you ended up with a function times dx which dy which dz. Not surprisingly, in your dictionary, when you take D, the function you get over here is called the divergence of the vector field. It's a scalar. And the physics books, again, will observe that if you think of that vector operator del, what are you doing with it in f? Dotting. You're dotting. You're dotting this with f1, f2, f3, so you get partial f1 with respect to x plus partial f2 with respect to 1 plus partial f3 with respect to z. So if you believe in that del operator, this is exactly del dot f. And so that finishes up this little table here div is starting with the vector field, dotting it with del, and that gives you a scalar. But we're not done yet, especially since Jonathan's interrupting. Go ahead. I don't mean to be rude, but... Yes, you do. Um, uh, I thought we were calling it Atlet after my presentation. Did <laughs> <laughs> you remember? Can we do a presentation well, on the Nabla? Nabla and Arvin. I completely forgot. <laughs> <laughs> We've got documentation. So what, what, what are we calling it? Atlet. Atlet? It's Delta, Delta backwards. backwards. Oh, Delta spelled backwards. No, I... Well, it's all going back. Part, yeah. <laughs> I'm calling it Del. <laughs> <laughs> now, what theorem do you know that talks about starting here and going to here. Hmm? If I do D and then I do D again. If I start here and I do D and then I do D again. But that must say something over on this side, mustn't it? So what am I saying when I do that twice? I start with a function, I take its gradient, and then I take curl, and I get zero. If I start here with a vector field, and I do it twice, what do I get? The curl of the div is zero. No. The div of the curl. Now, there are hypotheses that we needed to know that d squared was zero. What did we need to assume about our differential forms to know d squared was zero? Do you, do you remember what made it work? Was that mixed partials were the same in either order? You need at least c2. So you need the same thing here, at least c2. You need your function to be at least c2. You need your vector field. Do they not have to automatically be C2 if you can do this? Mm -hmm. No, I could talk about a vector field that was just continuous. Or maybe 
not even continuous, right? And so you really need more hypotheses to do these derivatives, right? All right, so what are the, what is the, in the formulation using the classical notation, what becomes of Stokes there? Running out of places to put things. So I, I really need another line in my dictionary here. But uh, there's only so much I can put in there. So what becomes of Stokes' theorem? Talking about manifold with boundaries sitting in R3. What are the possible dimensions that manifold could have? Manifold boundary could have three, or two, or one. So if M is a k-dimensional manifold sitting in R3, if k is one, Curve and so what? What is Stokes' theorem saying then? It's just what? What form of Stokes' theorem do we have? Integrating a one form. It's yeah. DF. It gives you the. It's just the FTC of line. Integrals. That's right. It's the FTC of line integrals. K equals two. We have a surface with a boundary curve. So I need a what form to start with? So if this is S, and this is boundary S, where do I start with if I want to do Stokes theorem on a two-dimensional manifold with boundary? With which, what form? Yeah, one, form. one form. One form. Yeah. Start with a one form, oh. and you say integral over the boundary of the one form is the integral of d omega over the surface, right? Put that in classical notation, please. So omega here is a one form. So this corresponds to a vector field. And if we put all our pieces together, what does Stokes theorem become then? Start with the left-hand side. Integral over the boundary of the surface of? What's the integral of omega in the classical notation? F dot t. Where I'm doing the work. So I did the work done by F equals the integral of the two form now becomes the what of what? But what do I do with curl F? It's a vector field. What do I want relative to the surface? What's the four-letter word? Flux. Flux. And I do the flux of what vector field? Across S. Curl. Three-dimensional manifold with boundary in R3 means I'm looking at what? A solid. A solid. So I've got some region omega, say, filled in, and its boundary is a? Shell. Shell. But it's a surface, right? Mm -hmm. So what does Stokes theorem now say? I start with omega in what land? What is omega now? Two-form. Two I integrate omega over the boundary of capital omega, which is the surface, and that's the same as integrating over the region, the three-manifold with boundary, d omega. 
What does this correspond to? Omega still corresponds to a vector field. But now I'm integrating omega and I'm computing what? Flux of f over the boundary of omega, so that's over a surface. So this side is now flux. And what happens on this, on the right side? I'm getting the divergence of f, and that's a function, and I'm integrating that function dv over omega. So I was alluding to this when we were using Stokes' theorem earlier, and we were doing this kind of thing, and I was saying that you're adding up what's being sourced inside when you compute the flux across the surface. I'm going to talk more about that now, today and tomorrow. So classically, for reasons that I don't truly know, this is called Stokes' theorem, or also Gradsky's theorem, and this is called the Divergence Theorem. Gee, I wonder why. Or Gauss's theorem. There's Gauss again. So this is called Stokes classically, and this is called Gauss or Divergence Theorem. I'm presuming Gauss's name is on it because of Gauss's law, and I'm going to show you tomorrow where Gauss's law comes in again with this stuff. But I promised, all right, so if you're a good physics student, you're supposed to know how to do this stuff without the notation we've been doing. That's addressed to Michael. You guys probably will prefer to do what you're more comfortable with. If you're more comfortable with the differential forms, that's fine. But you have to recognize what the problem is you're trying to do and put it in the notation. But what I do want you to have some, develop some understanding of is what these things mean. So that's what I'm going to work on next. Is there a hand set? So that, is that a, that's a function? No, F's a vector field here. What's that vector That's a function. And what that function is measuring, as you're going to see, that's this formula. It's measuring whether the vector field is creating or, or, or getting rid of stuff inside. So we'll talk about what that means. Is that one happening? The first one? Hmm? So what I want to, um, yeah, so I, I, have, I, I do have a funny story to tell you on me, and then I'll give you a, an overview of what we're going to do with this tomorrow. Um, so when I took the GREs and graduated, getting senior year applying to grad school, one of the questions on it was integrate a two-form over the two-sphere, and it gave it with a differential form. So you guys could do that in a second now, right? take D of it, and it was something that was really obvious. It's going to be zero by symmetry, as I recall. But I was so used to teaching freshman calculus students the classical notation. What did I do? I took the two form, and I did what? So you made it into a vector, vector field. field. And then I took the divergence, and then I said, oh. I had just spent three minutes doing what I should have done in three seconds. So let that be a lesson. What was the Is it funny to spend 30 minutes? No, you don't have 30 minutes when it's a three hour exam to do 65 problems. No, it's like on your test, we made a mistake. It'll be 30 minutes instead of five. Well. <laughs> but. So. What I'm gonna what I'm gonna do tomorrow is 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 talk to you about how those two versions of the theorem give you a physical interpretation of David Curl. So just as a preview of coming attractions, imagine you had a imagine you had F being the velocity field of water flow. So imagine you had this river with the 
water flowing along. And you were interested in understanding the curl of F. Well, imagine the water is, is going something like this. So imagine it's like taking the tangent to circle centered at the origin. We've done this vector field before. Are we talking about the unit tangent? No. Okay. It's actually shrinking because I want a differentiable vector field. So it's almost like confetti. Uh-huh. What do you what do you think curl of that vector field should be if it were doing that in three dimensions? Well, what one form does this correspond to? This F that I'm drawing here is actually looking like this. That's the tangent to the circle, and I'm making it be the same as z varies. I mean, this corresponds to this one form. So even if you can't do curl in your head quickly, you should be able to do d in your head quickly. What is it? Two. So that means curl of F should be what vector field? Zero, 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 two. So the curl should be pointing vertically and its magnitude has something to do with the fact how quickly these things are spinning around. So you should be able to convince yourself, well, this is what I'm going to start with tomorrow, that this integral is computing how much work that f does going around, say, a circular loop. Well, f is going in the same direction as the loop. So this is measuring how big f is tangent to the circle. And it's going to, what we're going to say tomorrow is, imagine taking a little um, paddle wheel and sticking it into the water. The water will make the paddles turn around. And the, more, the quicker the paddles turn around, the bigger the curl F is. And your question for tomorrow is, how, do you, how does that tell you the direction of curl F? Okay, we'll do that starting tomorrow.